For those who are new to the channel, Jess, who have not yet met you, who are you? Why are you here? And what is your title so that people can assess your credentials while listening to your knowledge? I, I guess I go by Jessica Rose, PhD now. I have a few degrees. I have five. I guess I'm speaking uh, with you and publicly with a lot of other people these days because I've had my eye on what's been going on for the last four years in terms of uh, looking at pharmacovigilance databases. And I guess I'm kind of uniquely qualified to speak on the subject matter of what's been going on because of my background. So I, I started in applied math, I moved to immunology, did a PhD in computational biology, and then I did a postdoc in biochem and also molecular biology. So computational biologist, PhD, anyone wants to undermine your, oh, you're not an immunologist or whatever, go suck a lemon, whoever wants to say something like that. No, no, you, you, don't, you don't need to suck a lemon. You can just go to my website, Jessica's Universe, and look at my CV. You can see what I've done. I don't know how long ago it was that you were on where the world discovered that there were DNA fragments or contamination uh, that had been found in certain vials or certain tests of the COVID jab. You learn from scratch, and I always just took for granted that there's always I presume there's always DNA in any shot, especially if it's a vaccine. I, I presume there would be like the DNA of whatever it is that it's trying to immunize you against. If you could dumb it down for someone like me, like what what is the DNA component contaminant? Why is it a risk? Like when I eat a steak, I'm eating DNA, I guess. And that doesn't alter my my own DNA. That's not a risk. That's a necessity. So like what is the DNA contaminant that was found a while back? What's the risk and what does it mean? All right. So first of all, what's important for everyone to know is how it got in there. Th this has been uh, reproduced in at least four labs uh, around the world. And by this, I mean investigating whether or not there is DNA in Pfizer and or Moderna vials. And in every single vial that has been tested, DNA has been discovered. And it's not really supposed to be there. To confirm what you're saying, like I, I just, one of the ones that'll corroborate this is you go to a fact check from Reuters. And then, you know, the fact check says, no evidence for vaccine DNA risk raised by Florida Surgeon General, because this has been an issue for a little while. But then, you know, they confirm there's no evidence to suggest that residual DNA fragments in mRNA COVID-19 vaccines pose a health risk. To yeah, so... Can I make a comment about that? This this is one of the things I'm becoming really good at detecting. They're Bullshit. very, very <laughs> good at, at, uh, at being sneaky. So read that sentence again. Yeah. There's no evidence to suggest that residual DNA fragments in mRNA COVID-19 vaccines pose a health risk. So they don't actually say there's no DNA, do they? No, no. In fact, they confirm that there is well, residual DNA. Like th that that confirms what I'm going to show in a bit is the disputed fact by the Australian government. So we're operating now not on the fact check that, no, there's no residual, there's no DNA. They're admitting there is DNA. They call it residual as if to minimize that. It's, it's residual, don't worry. But there's no evidence that it causes health risks as if you could even have that evidence in such a short period of time after discovering residual DNA. It, so it is not a disputable fact that there is, no. call it residual, there's DNA in some of these shots or all of these shots. Yeah, and, and this this is what uh, we anticipated. The, they move the goalpost. It's like first complete denial. No, there's no DNA. And then when they have to admit it, because Health Canada, the EMA, and I believe the FDA, and, and maybe even the MHRA in the UK, have publicly admitted that, that there is DNA in the vials and specific fragments of DNA called SV40, which I'll get to. So this isn't hypothesis anymore. This isn't a bunch of, you know, anti-vaxxers saying a bunch of stuff. This has been confirmed by the regulatory bodies and these health agencies that were pushing these products. The goalpost moves a little further and they say, well, there is, but you don't have to worry about re it. It's, it's residual. They, they, they may as well just call it innocent DNA. Yeah, there, there's innocent, yeah. residual, innocuous DNA. After having told us that there was no DNA, there should be no DNA in a vaccine. Is, is the bottom line? In my opinion, correct. If it's a, an mRNA vaccine, there shouldn't be. But I mean, they're, according to the EMA, the European Medicines Agency and these other regulatory bodies, you're allowed to have a certain amount at, a, at, a, at some threshold. But this, this is the clincher that I'll get to. I'll just say it and then I'll explain how it got in and come back. Those thresholds, 
that are in place are for naked DNA. They're not for lipid nanoparticle encapsulated DNA. Okay, so, hold so on. naked DNA versus LPN liquid li uh, lipid nano LNP. What's the difference? So naked DNA is easily degradable by the body. It's going to be readily removed. It's not going to pose a problem. Lipid nanoparticle encapsulated DNA. These these lipid little fat bubbles that are the the second part of the two part technology involved in these. COVID-19 shots, they are meant to only have modified mRNA in them. But be, I'll tell you how they got in, uh, that where we discovered this, they also contain DNA, specific DNA fragments that come from uh, the manufacturing process. So this is, this is a by design, they the way to get this genetic material into cells in order to command the cells by giving them the instructions with this RNA to make protein. You're fast track Trojan horsing foreign DNA fragments, a lot of them, according to what we're finding, directly into the cytosol of cells. And potentially they're going to the nucleus of cells, which is a whole other uh, ballgame. And now that's the part that I think I'm slowly piecing together is that the liquid nan uh, the lipid nanoparticle, the LNP, encapsulated whatever it was that they were wanting the body to absorb. And the liquid, the lipid nanoparticle is what facilitated absorption into, do I say the molecules of the human or is that is that wrong? They get into the cells. There's DNA in steak. You eat it. It's easily dissolved and, and it gets digested and whatever, but you're not creating a way to import that foreign DNA into your actual cells through this li lipid nanoparticle that... No, no, they're completely different things. Yeah, okay. it's, it's and completely different processes. Fat metabolism versus like transfection. So yeah, it's completely different. Would you expect to find DNA in traditional vaccines? There's a whole bunch of vaccines uh, that you would expect to see residual levels of DNA, I suppose. But like uh, the, the the claim to fame here and the 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 heightened danger, in my opinion, is, are, is this new delivery system, these lipid nanoparticles. We're just scratching the surface of what's been going on with the vaccine industry for like decades, right? Like. We, we, we actually don't have good answers to a lot of really basic questions. How do you explain to someone who still fallaciously equates traditional vaccines like the polio vaccine with this new mRNA? The technology is totally different. Uh, one was a, a, a traditional inert, I don't know if you call it particulate matter of the disease in order to trigger response. And this is a chemically induced manufactured tricking the, the body which without even using like how would you oversimplify it to someone who says a vaccine is a vaccine is a vaccine i don't know what else you could say other than it's not the same thing it's it's like uh it's protein versus genetic material wrapped in a lipid nanoparticle it's it's not not the same thing uh, it's completely different it's it's like tickling the immune uh, system with a, with a, with a foreign protein inert, so-called with, with an adjuvant in some cases versus something else's genetic material wrapped in a fat bubble that's designed <laughs> to get into, I mean, it's, it's not the same thing. mRNA as a, as a uh, delivery mechanism had been tried and had systematic problems in animals throughout the past yeah. in terms of. There are so many, what we call compendial standard issues remaining with this technology and even even the people in the biotech industry who are doing the, the research on these lipid nanoparticles haven't resolved the, the most basic issues like the rate limiting step, which is like the bottleneck of the entire process of introducing foreign genetic material into a cell to make protein. And that's when the lipid nanoparticle gets into the cell and, and by the way, it's not just one to one. You, you probably have a bunch of lipid nanoparticles, you know, getting inside a cell simultaneously, and therefore you have more uh, genetic material potentially being dumped. So they kind of get ab absorbed into the cell and, and stuffed into what we call an endosome. And as that endosome matures, the pH inside of it gets lower. And hypothetically, this, this is what, what we know, uh, this is going to alter the lipid nanoparticle. It's a cationically charged guy. 
and that's going to uh, enable the genetic material to be released. Basically, it, uh, if you want to think of it this way, it pops the fat bubble. And therefore, the payload, which is the genetic material inside it, is released into the cell, into the cytoplasm, where the ribosomes are going to be. And then that, you know, that mRNA, the messenger RNA, which is basically the coding material for this spike protein or whatever, is trafficked to ribosomes where those proteins are fabricated. This endosomal maturing, the pH lowering, that whole process, we have no data on what's actually going on there. And basically what I'm saying is that we have no concept of dose. You can inject 30 micrograms of mRNA, modified mRNA in a 300 microliter solution in a syringe into somebody's deltoid. And you have zero, zero predictive power as to how much mRNA is going to get into cells and how much protein will subsequently be produced. So we have leaves rustling in the wind assays, like antibody detection assays, to kind of make a, a guess as to how the body is reacting based on this 30 microgram amount. But we don't actually have a dose because that stuff that you're injecting isn't the stuff that the body's reacting to only. That stuff is the coding material for the stuff that the body will eventually react to. After years and billions of people were injected with this crap, we still don't have these, these very fundamental questions answered. Using a new technology that had never been used to deliver a, a, a vaccine before, for a coronavirus for which they had never even been able to develop a vaccine before, after they changed the definition of vaccine so that everybody was left there thinking, well, a vaccine is a vaccine is a vaccine. And now I understand what the lipid nanoparticle whole thing is about and what you're describing, the lipid nanoparticle, so it can trick your body into absorbing it into the cells. And now what you're describing is this is how it would have worked had what they delivered been the product that they tested, and then you go to the manufacturing, and then you start talking about manufacturing problems where they recalled millions of vials for reasons unknown, found foreign materials from foreign matter in these jab things because they were mass producing it with no quality control and producing hot batches that were literally killing people. It drives me freaking insane. And this is now, what are we, four years out? I still have to have conversations with people that say, well, oh, you're an anti-vaxxer because you don't like that. My goodness. Well, tell, tell your people who are saying that this, okay? Let's go back to the drawing board, Immunology 101. You're never going to get better immunity with something that you inhale, like a respiratory pathogen, like colds, flus, and the SARS viruses. You're never going to get better protection other than natural infection, because your, your muco mucosal immunity is all here, right? And you have to activate those factors in order to have the most potent response. And, and why should anybody know this, right? All we were hearing was a hoard immunity, and, and they didn't even know what that meant. If people had known that this is not the best way to get immunity against a SARS virus, they, they, they probably would have said, well, why would I get a shot that's not going to optimize my chances to not get sick.